Deborah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I first met Deborah in 2011, and uh, you obviously recognize I've been around a lot longer than Deborah. In fact, I've been in thrombosis medicine for 30 years, and I have a daughter in medicine and a son in medicine. And now when they look at me, they realize I'm a little marginal. I restrict my knowledge to a very small area, and uh, I'm one of the old guys. Um, but today I'm going to take you through a story of anticoagulation. And this is a fascinating story, a story which uh, Salim Yusuf told me about 10 years ago was all done because we had solved these issues. We had great drugs. But as you all know, the story never ends. It just goes to the next phase. I'm going to focus on what we've learned from the randomized trials. I want to start by reflecting where we've come from. And at the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about where we are going. And I was given good instructions about how to use this machine, and now I know how to do it. And I have a number of disclosures here. I'd like to start by going right back to the beginning of the 20th century. And these three drugs, all of us will recognize. This is a remarkable history of anticoagulant development. Remarkable because these three drugs were discovered by serendipity. They were introduced into clinical practice before we knew how they worked. And it wasn't until 20, 30, 40 years later that we discovered how they worked. Following the introduction of warfarin, there was a long gap during which there were essentially no advances in anticoagulant therapy. And in fact, I graduated in 1982. Eight. Um, don't hold that against me. It's a long time ago. And when I graduated in Perth, Western Australia, we had no alternatives to heparin and warfarin. The 1990s brought in the new era of low molecular weight heparin, and McMaster University's made an enormous contribution to that field. But even through till the turn of the century, we had no alternatives to warfarin. Then came the new era of direct oral anticoagulants. These are designer drugs. They're designed, as it were, like a key fits into a lock to specifically target individual coagulation proteins. And a truly stunning, I'd say, once in a career advance in therapeutics. And today, these have become the backbone of antithrombotic therapy. And it was with the emergence of these drugs and their reversal agents that folks at McMaster, and Deborah, you might remember this, told me, John, you should get out of this field. Sure, there are some applications to be nuanced, but really, this field is done and dusted. In 2012, I was co-author on this paper, The King is Dead, Warfarin, and then Direct Thrombin and Factor 10A Inhibitors, The Next Diadochian War. And at the time of writing this paper, I didn't know what the Diadochian Wars were. Those of you who are classical scholars will remember that when Alexander the Great uh, left the scene, his generals were left fighting amongst the spoils and it was as it were warfarin's gone now the new kids on the block are going to slug it out to see who's going to be the winner well that was just 10 years ago late last year jeff whites and i wrote a paper warfarin faring better vitamin k antagonists beat rivaroxaban and apixaban in the invictus and proact 10a trials and so you see, in just a short decade, this was, in fact, not the first example, but one of many examples where warfarin has actually proved to be 
the superior agent. So what I'd like to do then is review with you the areas where direct oral anticoagulants have failed. I will then uh, transition to addressing some other unmet needs in antithrombotic therapy. And then finally, I'll talk about emerging potential for drugs that target factor 11. So here is a list of what I deem to be the direct oral anticoagulant failures. And I want to take you very briefly through each of these. The first, mechanical heart valves and LVADs later on the scene, but I'll focus on mechanical heart valves. And we published one of the first papers with, uh, with DOAX and heart valves, which failed. I'll then talk about antiphospholipid syndrome, and then more recently, the rheumatic mitral stenosis story, the frail elderly, and breakthrough strokes in atrial fibrillation patients. So let's start with the mechanical heart valve story. I suspect many of you are familiar with this story. The Realign trial was a phase two study which tested dabigatran in comparison to warfarin in patients within the first three months of valve insertion, but also beyond the first three months. So there were two categories of patients. And this was a very carefully done study. The dose of dabigatran was titrated according to drug levels. And we were very optimistic that dabigatran would be the answer for mechanical valves. Well, an enormous disappointment. We, with up titrating dabigatran, to very high doses, up to 600 milligrams a day. There was a clear excess of bleeding with the bigger trend. This is a, the probability of an event on the y-axis, and this is time, and this is any bleeding. Uh, the bigger trend is the lower blue line, and <clears throat> the red line is warfarin. Now, not only did the bigger trend increase bleeding, but the bigger trend was associated with numerically more thrombosis. So fascinating result. Why would that be? I'll come back to that in a moment. Much more recently in New England Journal of Medicine evidence, the results of the PROACT 10A study were published. And this trial compared Pixaban with warfarin in patients with mechanical heart valves. <clears throat> and this trial also was stopped early. It was stopped early for harm, not mainly because of bleeding, but because of lack of efficacy. So two randomized trials with DOAX clearly inferior to warfarin. So why is this? Well, Jeff White's at McMaster has done a lot of work uh, in the test tube examining this question, and together with Iqbal Jaffa, who's a cardiac surgeon at our place. And this is one slide summary or a two slide summary of their findings. These were studies that did with the bigger tran and warfarin. And essentially what we have here on the X axis is the INR range. <clears throat> and on the Y axis, we have the bigger tran levels. And this is a measure of suppression of thrombin generation induced by valve leaflets in a test tube. And essentially what these data show is that to achieve the equivalent suppression of thrombin generation with an INR of 2 to 3.5, we need the bigger trend levels of 500 to 800 nanograms per mil, which is way above the levels that we would ever achieve with standard doses in clinical practice. The bigger trend just doesn't cut it. It just cannot suppress thrombin generation, presumably because it's located so far downstream in the coagulation pathway. And there is this amplification of uh, coagulation activation and thrombin generation, which overwhelms the bigger trend. The story is the same with the ETP, the endogenous thrombin potential. Um, likewise, this is with the leaflets. The lower panels are with the Teflon sewing rings. The same story. And this on the right here is the usual 
trough on treatment levels of dabigatran. Here are the same data, but this time with apixaban and rivaroxaban. And once again, neither apixaban nor rivaroxaban at currently used doses can suppress thrombin generation to the same extent as warfarin with an INR of 2 to 3.5. This may be, as I, as I mentioned, because the Bigatran and Rivaroxaban and Pixaban work relatively downstream. The other advantage of warfarin is that it targets both the intrinsic or the contact pathway as well as the extrinsic pathway. So if blood is exposed to an artificial surface, vitamin K antagonists are blocking coagulation upstream, but they're specifically blocking the, the uh, contact pathway by targeting factor nine. So that's mechanical heart valves, the first failure of DOAX. The second is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And you know a lot more here in Ottawa about antiphospholipid syndrome than I do, but I'm going to show you very briefly, this comes from a series of randomized trials which were subjected to meta-analysis in 2023. And these randomized trials were all tiny. They compared DOAX with warfarin in antiphospholipid syndrome. And here are the results for venous thrombosis. And the results here are essentially neutral. But when we look at arterial thrombosis and stroke in particular, there is an enormous relative excess of the risk of stroke with DOAX compared with warfarin. So this is the second failure of DOAX. What's the mechanism? To be honest, I don't know. This is a figure taken from a paper written by, um, actually that, that's been quoted by Noel Chan and Jeff Weitz in their, um, in their paper addressing this topic, possibly it's related to the activation of platelets by antiphospholipid antibodies, but I'm not sure how, um, how accurate this hypothesis is. The third failure is demonstrated in the Invictus trial. And the Invictus trial set out to replace warfarin with a direct oral anticoagulant in low and middle income countries where patients with rheumatic atrial fibrillation cannot reliably access warfarin or cannot reliably monitor warfarin. And there's a huge population of patients with rheumatic heart disease, upwards of 40 million people. Many of them have um, atrial fibrillation. There were no randomized control trials of any antithrombotic therapy in rheumatic atrial fibrillation. And only a small fraction of those with atrial fibrillation are prescribed anticoagulants. And stunningly, the time and therapeutic range with warfarin is only about 30% in low and middle income countries. So the Invictus trial randomized 4,500 patients, a very carefully done study, compared rivaroxaban with warfarin, and we all fully anticipated that rivaroxaban would be a clear winner. Well, this is why we do randomized trials. Another stunning result. On the y-axis, we have the uh, incidence of the cumulative incidence of stroke, systemic embolism, MI or death. On the x-axis, we have time. And there are at least two remarkable findings. The first is overall vitamin K antagonists are a clear winner. And the second is that the curves cross over at 12 to 18 months. Initially, it seems that rivaroxaban is going to be superior to warfarin. But like some of the classic surgical trials, there is a crossover. And in surgical trials, we're used to seeing crossovers early on because the side effects of surgery are evident early and then surgery proceeds to show it is superior to some medical therapy. But here it's happening late. 
So what's going on here? Well, if we look at the composite outcome and we break it down, overall, there is about a 25% increase in events with rivaroxaban versus warfarin. But this seems to be driven almost entirely by mortality. There is an excess of stroke and the excess is about 50%. It's statistically significant, but the number of events here is only about 25, whereas there's about 100 excess deaths in people treated with rivaroxaban versus warfarin. Again, why is this? This could be ischemic events. This could be bleeding. This could be something else. If we look at bleeding, it's certainly not bleeding because rivaroxaban compared with warfarin actually numerically at least reduces bleeding. And it's the same pattern for life-threatening intracranial and fatal bleeding. So why was warfarin superior to rivaroxaban? It's not explained by differences in stroke. It's not explained by differences in bleeding. But when we look at core specific mortality, it seems to be driven by heart failure and sudden cardiac death. Now I'm gonna come back to this in another scenario because there is a pattern emerging, a biological pattern that may explain this. The effect also, as we've mentioned, was delayed. So again, how might we explain this? I remember sitting at the European Society of Cardiology meeting in the room uh, in the amongst investigators chatting about this and looking it up on Google and thinking, how can warfarin influence mortality and do so through a mechanism that doesn't involve clotting? And even though I'd been in thrombosis for 25 years, I knew very little, and I still know very little, about uh, non-clotting vitamin K-dependent proteins. But there is a group of vitamin K-dependent tissue-based proteins which interact with the TAM receptors, and the TAM receptors are upregulated in cardiovascular disease. These TAM receptors are activated by two uh, sets of vitamin K-dependent proteins. The one of greatest interest is GAS-6. Now, GAS-6 has structural homology with protein S, and it appears to play a role in um, driving myocardial infarction ischemia reperfusion injury and also in vascular remodeling by binding to TAM receptors. If we measure GAS-6 in patients with heart failure, there is a graded association with mortality. GAS-6 is blocked by warfarin. The effects might be expected to be delayed because these are not immediate effects, they're long-term effects of GAS-6. Now that seems like a wild hypothesis, but I'll share with you one other piece of information from the randomized trials, which would support this hypothesis. Now GAS-6 is also upregulated in obesity. And we just published in circulation, a paper uh, looking at the four large randomized trials of vitamin K antagonists in atrial fibrillation about 60,000 patients. And here are the data according to BMI. And as BMI goes up, and we look at stroke or systemic embolism, DOAX in the blue line, compared with warfarin in the red line, retain their advantages. The same story for major bleeding, although the contrast is attenuated at high BMI, the lines don't cross over. For intracranial hemorrhage, across the spectrum of BMI, there is a big reduction, but there is a crossover. There is a crossover for net clinical outcome, which is driven by an excess of mortality. 
when we look at the excess of mortality at high BMIs, these patients have high GAS-6 levels, the excess deaths are due to sudden cardiac death and heart failure. So is this an effect of warfarin on tissue dependent vitamin uh, tissue based vitamin k dependent proteins we don't know but certainly the plot thickens i'll very briefly touch on the frail elderly and breakthrough strokes in anticoagulated atrial fibrillation the frail elderly study was conducted in the netherlands uh, uh, by our colleagues there uh, and their hypothesis, and you know the Netherlands have been for decades one of the powerhouses of vitamin K antagonist therapy. And I remember going there in the early days of the DOAX and going to the heartland, so to speak, of European uh, vitamin K antagonist uh, supporters. And it was like going into tiger country because they were saying to me, and I remember many lectures and many symposia and chats over dinner you know we've got it sorted out warfarin or in their case acenocumarol well managed is going to be at least as good as doax and these doax are dangerous you can't reverse them we're going to stick with what we know and what we do well you just can't manage vitamin k antagonists well, even the Dutch, and I have Dutch heritage, and Dutch tend to be a little stubborn like me, even the Dutch had to give up on this idea over time because the clinicians adopted DOAX. But they still remain convinced in their beliefs, at least the thrombosis folks. So they decided to do a randomized trial restricted to the frail elderly, comparing vitamin K antagonists to DOAX. And these were people over the age of 80 uh, who were on acenocumarol. They were randomized to either continue acenocumarol or to stop acenocumarol and switch to a DOAC. So here is the, actually there are over 75. Here are the data. This is the Groningen Frailty Index. I won't go through the details, but they were truly a frail people. They had to have preserved renal function, so they either stayed on a vitamin K antagonist or they switched to a DOAC. The main outcome was major or clinically relevant, non-major bleeding, and secondary outcomes were thromboembolism and mortality. Now, I've gilded the lily a little bit. Uh, they weren't setting out necessarily to prove that vitamin K antagonists were better than DOACs, but there was that background belief. Now, the patients who were enrolled, their average age was 83. Um, and as I said, they were frail. They were at high risk of stroke. In the intervention arm, a number of DOACs were used, but the dominant ones were rivaroxaban. Uh, more than 50% of people, or around 50%, got rivaroxaban in the control group. This trial was stopped early. And it was stopped early for harm, and it was stopped early for harm due to DOAX, because DOAX had a big increase in bleeding. But this seems to be counterintuitive. It seems to be inconsistent with what we've learned from the big randomized trials of warfarin versus DOAX. So how do we explain this? Well, this is another challenging uh, issue. When we look at subgroups, we do not see any inconsistency, but of course the confidence intervals here are all very wide and there is really no power to explore subgroups. These were older patients stabilized on a vitamin K antagonist. They were managed by specialized clinics. There was a delay in start of the DOACs in the experimental group, but that would have biased it the other way. There was overlap of warfarin and DOACs in the transition phase, which could have increased the bleeding in the DOAC arm, but bleeding excess continued throughout the study, certainly well beyond the transition phase. 
Maybe it's related to the dominant use of rivaroxaban, a well-kept secret in randomized trials of DOAX versus warfarin is that dibigatran and rivaroxaban both have an excess of bleeding in old patients. And certainly uh, in my practice, I never use rivaroxaban or dibigatran anymore in people over the age of 75. Only apixaban and adoxaban have consistent reductions in major bleeding in people over the age of 80. Perhaps the dominant use of rivaroxaban in the experimental group contributed to the excess of bleeding. But in truth, I don't think we have a clear explanation. Then finally, a breakthrough stroke in anticoagulated atrial fibrillation patients. And Alex Benz, who's one of our fellows, recently published in the European Heart Journal, and what he did was he looked at the combined AF data set, the four big randomized trials of DOAX versus warfarin, and he selected patients who experienced stroke during the study. And he set the clock at time zero. And so these are people who had experienced a first stroke during the trial on a DOAC. And these are the event rates following that first stroke. So here is one year, and we're already at six. Um, in fact, it's around 8% at one year, and it's around 11% at two years. Now, this is the overall cohort. When he split this by warfarin or a DOAC, people who switched to a warfarin after a stroke on a DOAC did much better than people who stayed on a DOAC after their first stroke. So what does that mean? I'm not sure. We are in the process of uh, embarking on a randomized trial here. So the grants are going in. But this brings me to the end of the first part of my story. I've shown you five areas where in the last decade, since the introduction of DOAX, We've learned that warfarin or vitamin K antagonists are superior to DOAX. Mechanical heart valves, antiphospholipid syndrome, rheumatic mitral stenosis, the frail elderly, and perhaps breakthrough strokes in patients anticoagulated for atrial fibrillation. I'm going to turn to other unmet needs in oral anticoagulation, and this will be very brief just to uh, complete the portfolio of conditions where we have problems still in 2024. And I've just listed these on one slide here. There are a number of areas where DOACs are unproven, advanced kidney disease, less so LV thrombus, but no randomized, no substantive randomized trials. Unusual sites of thrombosis, we have cohort data, but no randomized trials. Probably these are less important unmet needs, but advanced kidney disease, a huge problem. And then there are a number of areas where DOACs are contraindicated. And the most important of these is people who are deemed to have an unacceptable risk of bleeding. Clearly, warfarin's not an answer here either, but if I had to select one area in anticoagulation where we still desperately need better therapies, it is in patients at high risk of bleeding, either because of prior bleeding or because they have conditions associated with the high risk of bleeding. And then less important, but still relevant, certain drug-drug interactions, liver dysfunction with coagulopathy, and pregnancy. And this brings me to the last part of my presentation. Where do we go to from here? And I'd like to speak about the factor 11 inhibitors, which have had an extraordinary impact on not just the uh, 
the financial world who have invested very heavily, not just in drug companies who uh, are spending enormous effort on developing these drugs, but clinicians and researchers have become incredibly enthusiastic about this field. Is the hype warranted? And we could anticipate, and this slide, uh, this green zone in my timeline suggests that these agents, if they are proven to be safe and effective, could emerge in the marketplace in the next two to three years, the next generation of anticoagulants. Now, what would be the ideal characteristics of a new class of anticoagulant that could overcome DOAC failures and that could meet the unmet needs? We would certainly want them to retain the practical advantages of DOACs. We'd like them to have a low potential for drug-drug interactions. We want them to be de not dependent on kidney function for clearance. And these three certainly seem to apply to at least some of the factor 11 inhibitors. We'd like them to be effective where current Current DOACs are relatively ineffective, not just in patients who have breakthrough events, such as, uh, such as uh, in atrial fibrillation, but also, and perhaps most importantly, where coagulation is activated following exposure of blood to an artificial surface, such as in a mechanical heart valve. And we want them to have a low or a lower risk of bleeding. So why target factor 11? Well, we have background evidence that supports the hypothesis that targeting factor 11 will reduce bleeding, but also be effective for thrombosis prevention. <clears throat> and this comes from epidemiologic data in patients with inherited factor 11 deficiency or hemophilia C. It comes from experiments in animals and in 2015 or thereabouts, Harry Buller and colleagues from the Netherlands published one of the first studies of a factor 11 inhibitor given preoperatively, demonstrating that there was no excess of bleeding, but thrombosis was prevented. So there is a nice story that targeting factor 11 will be effective and will reduce bleeding. Now, what's the mechanistic basis for this? And if we think about coagulation pathways, the basics, I know there are some medical students here and they all love coagulation because it is so simple conceptually. And I say that seriously because truly coagulation is very, very simple conceptually. The old fashioned intrinsic, extrinsic common pathway model applies very well. I've renamed them and, uh, well, I haven't renamed them, but we should think of them as the tissue factor pathway. This is the extrinsic pathway, the contact pathway, the intrinsic pathway. There are two major mechanisms by which coagulation can be activated. They converge on a common pathway and the common pathway through thrombin generation mediates hemostasis, but also pathological thrombosis. Now, of course, this is a gross simplification, but this concept applies very well. Now, again, what, why would we target factor 11 when we look at this pathway? Well, let's think about it. When tissue factor is released following an extravascular injury. So this is trauma or an intravascular injury, which is plaque rupture. We activate the tissue factor pathway to generate thrombin, which mediates hemostasis and thrombosis. If we focus on extravascular injury, there is so much thrombin generated that we drive hemostasis 
and we do not substantially, at least this is the story, we do not substantially require amplification of thrombin generation involving the contact pathway. On the other, and when we use conventional anticoagulants, we block factor 10 or factor 2, and thereby we prevent hemostasis. If we target factor 11, we have no effect on hemostasis because this amplification pathway is not engaged. Now, if we look at intravascular injury with plaque rupture and tissue factor release and activation of the tissue factor pathway, we form only a modest amount of thrombin. There is not enough thrombin here to drive pathologic thrombosis. We need this amplification pathway to generate enough thrombin to cause thrombus formation. If we block this pathway with heparin and warfarin, we will prevent pathologic thrombosis, but we will also prevent hemostasis. On the other hand, if we target factor 11, we keep the hemostasis pathway open, but we selectively block this amplification pathway. And so drugs that target factor 11 are amplification pathway blockers. They selectively take this part of the pathway out of, out of operation. We preserve hemostasis, but prevent thrombosis. So that's the story. The other big advantage, theoretically, of factor 11 inhibitors, they don't just block this amplification pathway, but they also block the contact pathway, which of course is what we want to block when we have a mechanical valve, when we have a hemodialysis circuit, when we put catheters into, when, when cardiologists put catheters into patients or with all sorts of other devices. So factor 11 inhibitors can be effective when thrombosis is induced by tissue factor, but can also be effective when thrombosis is induced by exposure of blood to an artificial surface. And that's shown again here, when this extravascular injury, there's a lot of tissue trauma, there's a huge thrombin burst, you really don't need that amplification loop. On the right-hand side, when there's intravascular injury, there's a small amount of thrombin generated. You don't generate enough thrombin to get a thrombus. You need this amplification pathway, which you then take out of circulation by inhibiting factor 11. Well, what have we learned from the clinical trials to date? This is a summary slide of some of the series of trials that have been done so far. To the left on this slide are the phase two trials in venous thrombosis prevention, in atrial fibrillation, following stroke, following myocardial infarction. The key findings of these trials, by and large, factor 11 inhibitors reduce bleeding versus active. By and large, factor 11 inhibitors have similar rates of bleeding compared with placebo. Factor 11 inhibitors can prevent thrombosis, but none of the trials were adequately powered to demonstrate whether they are as effective or more effective than existing agents. But there are some clues emerging in the literature about efficacy. And this is a factor 11 meta-analysis. And it includes trials of factor 11 inhibitors versus low molecular weight heparin, versus DOAX, and versus placebo. And if we look at the numbers, and this is very crude, it combines agents with different targets, versus low molecular weight heparin. These are mainly venous thrombosis prevention studies. There's less bleeding of any bleeding. And there seems to be efficacy. There's a reduction in thrombotic events. So factor 11 inhibitors are safe or safer, and they work. Versus direct oral anticoagulants in atrial fibrillation, 
predominantly in atrial fibrillation. They reduce bleeding. That is all bleeding. Maybe not major bleeding. But the signal for efficacy goes the wrong way. And this is a worrying trend. If this is real, it's been dismissed because it's a crude meta-analysis against different targets. If we look versus placebo, we do see an increase in bleeding. We see an increase in both any bleeding and perhaps in major bleeding. And it's unclear whether we're getting efficacy. And this is another worrying trend in terms of factor 11 inhibitors. Now, this meta-analysis was done before two key trials were recently stopped early. And one is the Azalea Timmy 71 trial. And in the interest of time, I'll just rapidly go through this. Factor 11 inhibitors. This was uh, um, abalasimab, an antibody that targets factor 11, given at two doses. One produced 97% inhibition of factor 11. One induced 99% inhibition of factor 11. The two doses of abalasimab had huge reductions in bleeding versus rivaroxaban. Here are the two doses, the high dose and the low dose. Both had big reductions in bleeding. But when we look at efficacy, there was a dose-dependent increase in stroke or systemic embolism. Not statistically significant, but certainly worrying. The second trial that was stopped early was a phase three trial, and this was the Oceanic AF study. And this trial was stopped after thousands of patients had been enrolled, and it was stopped due to lack of efficacy of the factor 11 inhibitor. So we have meta-analysis data that show worrying trends. We have Azalea Timmy 71, which shows big reduction in bleeding versus warfarin in, um, sorry, versus rivaroxaban and atrial fibrillation. And then we have Oceanic AF, which is stopped early for lack of efficacy of Ascendexian versus uh, the co active control arm of Pixaban. Why? Are factor 11 inhibitors failing? At least, why did they fail in the Oceanic AF study? Is it the play of chance? That seems unlikely. Is it the wrong target? Is there a difference between targeting factor 11 and lowering it, or 11A, which is targeted by Ascendexian? Seems unlikely to me. Is it that Ascendexian is given at the wrong dose? There's a lot of talk at the moment that maybe Ascendexian was incorrectly dosed. Or is it the incorrect hypothesis? And I wouldn't be surprised if the hypothesis that 11 reduces bleeding and is going to prevent thrombosis is a little flawed. If we come back to our figure of factor 11 and its potential role in thrombosis and hemostasis, to me, it seems overly simplistic that extravascular injury produces a very large thrombin burst and doesn't involve any amplification. And we know this because you, you block amplification pathway, you will get an increase in bleeding. So we know that amplification is involved in hemostasis. It also seems overly simplistic to me that Thrombus formation is critically dependent on amplification because if we block this amplification pathway, we're still going to get some thrombin causing thrombus formation. So whilst conceptually the factor 11 story sounds great, I don't think that it can explain hemostasis and thrombosis. And I don't think that selectively blocking 11 is going to have such a definitive effect on, um, uh, on hemostasis and thrombosis. There are a number of ongoing phase three trial programs. We're going to learn a lot more about this in the next two years. So Dr. Siegel, uh, um, Dr. Liu, ladies and gentlemen, 
Thank you for your time listening to me. I've taken through you through a story of anti-coagulation uh, and the history of the development of anti-coagulation. I've emphasized that although DOACs are a once-in-a-lifetime advance and although they are here to stay, they have a number of important limitations. Warfarin retains a huge role in selected settings. We need to better understand why DOACs fail, and there are many uh, mechanisms that are operational. And whilst we hope very much that 11 inhibitors will be the solution, I'm afraid to say that I think that the hype is not supported by the evidence to date, but the truth will be known soon. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Eichelblum. That was great. Um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody is just jumping up here to ask questions. So please join me on the microphone if that is the case. Um, there is a question online from Dr. Fraser Rubens who asks, what is your opinion of the studies comparing DOAX and warfarin in patients early post-op with a tissue aortic valve and atrial fibrillation? Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, that's a, a critically important question. Uh, and the quick answer is, it's unresolved. I don't think we have a sufficient body of high quality evidence to uh, inform whether we should choose a DOAC versus warfarin in tissue valves. In fact, I wonder whether we've even proven to date that we need anticoagulation at all. And certainly in our institution, the practice had varied greatly amongst cardiac surgeons. Uh, there are the mechanistic imaging studies that suggest that thrombus formation on valves early on is more important than we had thought in the past. Um, but uh, there is an ongoing randomized trial also at McMaster to address this question. So right now, I think the jury is still out. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one from the audience here. Thank you, for, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Are all DKA equivalent? Well, uh, there's been no <clears throat> high quality evaluation of different vitamin K antagonists. Um, uh, we use warfarin almost exclusively here. Acenocumarol's got a shorter half-life. The Dutch swear by it. Um, uh, f what's the other one? Fenprocumon has got a very long half-life. I think it's widely used in, in Germany. That's fluindione is used in France, um, and there are a number of others. None have been compared head to head. Uh, I think more important than um, <clears throat> the drug may be familiarity with the drug. They're complex to manage, and if you can, if you if you know your drug really well, you're going to get much better results. And it's like us using a senocumarol. We're not very good at it because we're not used to its half-life, et cetera. So bottom line is, I think they all work. They all work well. Uh, there may be differences among them, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any high quality evidence. There's just one other comment, not a question in the chat. Dr. Nair says, fantastic summary of the systemic oral anticoagulation story. Always a pleasure to listen to Dr. Eichelblum. Thanks very much. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, just a fantastic story. It's, it's just uh, amazing. And the green zone, obviously, you know, the exciting part. Uh, two questions. One is actually, you know, regarding the frail elderly, you know, because we look after a lot of patients, you know, in that category. And uh, what is the practical, you know, sort of uh, advice you, could, uh, you would give at this time, you know, given the data? The question uh, also is a, a bit of a discussion we had yesterday, and that is that the uh, you know, factor 11 appears to does this uh, amplification, and therefore, you know, reduction appears to be reasonable. But is there any a potential lack of inhibition in terms of factor 10? You know, have people actually measured, you know, exactly what the impact there is? And therefore, you know, the concept that we were talking about, you know, possibly combinatorial, you know, sort of a, a, a factor yeah. 11, a factor 10 in a, you know, titrated fashion. So great questions. I'll take your second question first. Um, and I think what you're alluding to is, you know, we target one specific coagulation protein, but there might be upstream or downstream consequences thereof, of which we have no knowledge. And in, in respect of factor 11 inhibitors, we simply don't know 
what the other effects would be. Um, your suggestion that combining an 11 inhibitor maybe with a 10 inhibitor is intriguing, and I think it is theoretically very attractive. If we used a lower dose of an effective anticoagulant <clears throat> to block thrombin generation, and then we combine that with a high dose of an 11 inhibitor, which doesn't cause bleeding, <clears throat> to me, that would be a, a perfect way to tackle this question. As far as the frail elderly goes, no one really knows. The excess of bleeding in frail AF was so large that most of us are not comfortable accepting the number. On the other hand, it was a randomized trial and it was an open trial, but it was a randomized trial. It was very carefully done and we cannot ignore the results. My own interpretation is if you have a patient on warfarin and they're doing well and they've got excellent control, just keep them on the warfarin. If you're starting a new patient on an anticoagulant and they're over 80, I still think that the weight of the evidence supports the use of a DOAC, either a Pixaban or a Doxaban, in preference to Rivaroxaban or the Bigotran. That would be my take, but I suspect that uh, opinions will vary. And in the Netherlands, maybe warfarin is, is uh, more dominant or acenocumarol. <clears throat> John, thanks very much. Our excellent presentation, a really, really comprehensive overview um, and amazing work that you and your colleagues have been doing. Thank you. Um, I had a separate question. You talked about v VTE and AF. What about left ventricular thrombus? What data do we know about that, both post-infarct and, and other cardiomyopathy-related thrombus, et cetera? Yeah, thank you for that. And uh... <clears throat> Yes, the LV thrombus story is a really important one because it's so common. I mean, every day of the week in coronary cares, people are struggling with this question. <laughs> Partly the choice of treatment is philosophic. There are some who say, well, warfarin's been around for 70 years, therefore it, it, it's the number one there and we should use warfarin. And some of my colleagues at McMaster would do that. Others would say, well, there's no evidence that DOACs do worse than warfarin. We have a large number of observational data. The, the DOACs have such a big advantage in terms of uh, convenience and predictable effects that it's reasonable to use a DOAC. In fact, in 2023, the American Heart Association put out a, a statement by uh, uh, an ad, ad hoc committee, scientific statement, where they summarized all the literature and they said it seems very reasonable to use a DOAC as an alternative to warfarin. My own approach is these are high stakes thrombi um, in the LV. I tend to give them five days of low molecular heparin and then I go to a DOAC. Last week I was on the service and someone had a huge LV thrombus and the cardiology team was so nervous, they insisted on warfarin. There's not much I can do about that, but I think it's very reasonable uh, as long as you get that initial therapy in, high quality therapy, and I use low molecular heparin because I know it works, uh, and then to go directly to a DOAC. Uh, we desperately need some randomized trials. We tried to do a trial, J.D. Schwalm, many years ago, uh, at McMaster, I was involved. I think we recruited 20 patients. It was so tough. And so we gave up. There's one, time for one last question. Quick. Thank you for the review of the history and also the future. I have a two-part question. So earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that when looking at the levels of the DOACs that were required to actually affect the platelet <laughs> activation, you would never reach that place without a current therapeutic dosage. Is there a way for us to safely get to those levels and also mitigate the risk of bleeding? For example, this may be very radical, but using other agents like TXA to reduce the risk of catastrophic bleeding, whereas also reaching a therapeutic level to affect those positive clinical outcomes. Yes, so excellent question. So a lot's been written about DOAC drug levels, uh, whether we should monitor them, what, are, what is the therapeutic range? Um, these questions are unanswered because... Um, the DOACs were tested in fixed dose without monitoring. And we're about to publish a paper where we've summarized all the literature we, and we try to report at least the on-treatment ranges so that we roughly know where we expect to be. One of the challenges is that the 
drug levels, at, for example, at the site of a mechanical valve adjacent to the leaflet may need to be higher than, than in another setting. So it's really quite a complex issue. Do we measure the area under the curve? Do we look at the peak? Do we look at the trough? Do we look at the level, for example, uh, in tissues versus uh, at the site of a mechanical heart valve? I don't know. I don't think we have any information that we could somehow use high levels and then mitigate bleeding risk at other sites. For example, get a high level at the valve and prevent bleeding in the gut. Um, intriguing thoughts. I, I don't know of any solutions there. Thank you. So I think we'll wrap up. Uh, it's 8.30 and really appreciate you coming from McMaster in person. It makes such a big difference for our discussion. And thanks to everybody for attending.